Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, the, uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. Um, we normally do these sessions every Wednesday morning live at 10 a.m. Central Time. This week we're doing a special session on Tuesday because tomorrow is the 4th of July and we, as with many librarians who may even be watching us, are closed for the day. Um, tomorrow. So we're here on Tuesday um, at 10 a.m. doing this. Um, all of our sessions are recorded, however, so if you are unable to join us live on Wednesdays or as in Tuesday, um, you can always watch our recordings um, later and um, see all of our four-something years worth of recordings that we have out there. Okay. So this, um, and we have commission staff that do presentations, and we bring in, bring in guest speakers sometimes, as we have today. Um, today we've brought from just down the street, <laughs> um, from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, the uh, Center for Digital Research in the Humanities. I got it written down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karen Delziel and Liz Loring. If I turn the camera. We actually have a camera person behind me. There you go. Um, and they are going to um, tell us what the heck is digital communities and why do libraries care and what it has to do with us. Okay. I suppose. And here we'll just move the microphone over to you guys. So, All right. There we go. So take it away, guys. Okay. Um, digital humanities is a popular new buzzword in the library world, but it's been around for a while in academia mostly. In the audience. Oh, hi. Okay. But I've, 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 it's okay. okay. <laughs> in this presentation, Elizabeth and I will explain the digital humanities, uh, what it is, give a few examples of how it's done, and uh, end with a few places that you can look for further resources if you're interested in getting involved. So I will let Elizabeth Lorang introduce herself. <laughs> Hi, my name is Liz Lorang. I'm a research assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Nebraska. And in the center, I manage two digital projects, the Walt Whitman Archive, which is an electronic scholarly edition of Walt Whitman's works, and Civil War Washington, a place, digital place-based study of the nation's capital during the Civil War. And I want to start today with a definition of digital humanities. Um, and I think it's, it's important to say that even among people who identify as digital humanists, probably even between Karen and me, there is not really an agreed upon definition of the term or whether you say what is digital humanities or what are the digital humanities and that <laughs> distinction sort of between a, um, you know, a field or um, ways of studying the humanities is important, an important um, ambiguity, I suppose. So as a result, the field or the methods of study often get defined indirectly. Um, so we might say this, this project is digital humanities and the qualities of the project are A, B, and C. So digital humanities has something to do with A, B, and C. But such a method of definition gets unwieldy fast. So for our presentation today, I will be somewhat brave and offer my own working definition to which we might add or define. And I define digital humanities as, or DH, which, oh, not working. Go ahead, try again. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, or DH, and we'll probably use the DH term throughout our talk today. So whenever we say DH, we mean digital humanities. But it is an interdisciplinary field of study that employs electronic, electronic and or computational processes for the preservation, documentation, exploration, and interpretation of cultural artifacts. So to clarify a little further, today we probably most often equate digital humanities projects with the World Wide Web, but digital humanities projects can, and indeed many do, take place off or outside of the web, and a web presence is maybe only a small component or used for publication of scholarship that actually takes place offside the web. So although the digitization of materials is often an important component of digital humanities projects, digitization alone is not necessarily what we would call digital humanities. That digitization of materials is not the end of digital humanities, but is a means to an end. Certainly much of the work that digital humanists do could not happen without the digitization of primary documents, including books, newspapers, correspondence, and a range of manuscript items as well as three-dimensional objects. But digital humanities also requires a level or layer of critical inquiry and interpretation, and this inquiry or interpretation can take on a number of forms. 
So for something to be digital humanities, there has to be a layer of human intervention and interpretation. Even in data mining, another buzzword, for example, computers are not providing answers, but rather they offer additional points of access for human interpretation. To help put these somewhat abstract ideas into perspective, I'd like to talk about them briefly in regard to two digital projects on which I work, the Walt Whitman Archive and Civil War Washington. Much of our work on the Whitman Archive, which is at whitmanarchive.org, um, is the editing of Whitman's manuscripts, including poetry manuscripts, prose manuscripts, and notebooks. In editing these manuscript materials, we acquire high-resolution, lossless images of the original documents, which we use for archival purposes and for creating derivatives for web presentation. We transcribe and encode the manuscripts in the Text Encoding Initiative implementation of XML, and we generate HTML versions of the XML for online display using XSLT style sheets. On the one hand, this sounds like fairly straightforward, even conventional by current standards, digitization work. Interpretation, however, is embedded at nearly every stage. In the case of Whitman, it can be very difficult to tell a prose manuscript from a poetry manuscript. When we make a choice about what genre a manuscript is, our decision gets encoded and is an interpretational layer. In addition, using TEI requires us to say what we believe about a chunk of text um, and, some, what we, and the structure and function of the manuscript. Is some text a poetic line? Is it a paragraph or not quite a paragraph and instead something different? If we were interested only in searching Whitman's corpus, we would not need to identify each of these constituent parts, their structure and their function. But we on the Whitman Archive often agonize over details such as these because um, we believe that that tells us something about the manuscript as a whole, and it allows for additional interpretation of the text in consideration of other texts of the same type. When we edit Whitman's manuscripts, we are interpreting them, and our interpretations are encoded in the metadata. And on the screen now is a, a snippet of some TEI code, I believe for one of the Civil War notebooks that we now make available on the Whitman Archive. And you'll see that we've indicated such, I mean, what structural units we identify text to be, what has been deleted and added, and other structural and um, editorial components. Another project that I work on studies Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. This is Civil War Washington at civilwardc.org. We're creating a website that brings together digitized text and images, a geographic information system, and a relational database. The texts, locations, and relationships we're interested in as a project have so far dealt with issues relating to medical history and race, slavery, and emancipation. We've created a database that allows us to record information about people, places, events, organizations, and documents, as well as about relationships among these entities. Importantly, we have not identified one or the other of these categories as more important than another. All are on the same level in the database hierarchy, and we can create relationships between all of them. People may be related to other people, as well as to events, organizations, documents, and places. The structure of the database is an argument and an interpretation of what we regard as important about the war and the experience of the war. Documents, such as photographs, newspapers, and maps, are important not only because they represent a person or a place. Other database representations of the Civil War may be organized only around events, and other items matter only then in relation to these events. But this focus limits the people, places, organizations, and documents a project might include, which is a model of the war that we did not want to replicate for our project. For Civil War Washington, then, we consider part of our digital humanities work to be thinking about databases as models of the world, what we believe about the world, and what we regard as important for the study of Civil War DC. My goal in giving these two quick examples from the Whitman Archive and Civil War Washington is to illustrate our working definition and to give a context for other parts of our talk today. I've actually jumped ahead a bit since what I want to talk about next is the history of the field. 
But as I'm giving the history of digital humanities, these examples from the Whitman Archive in Civil War Washington will give you a sense of where this history leads. From a single scholar who saw the potential of computers to help in his interpretation of a major religious figure to major interinstitutional federally supported collaborations. So part two, the history of digital humanities. Digital humanities may sound like a new field but its history stretches back nearly 60 years. Father Roberto Busa, a Jesuit priest and scholar of Thomas Aquinas, is regarded as the founder of the field we now call digital humanities. It's, uh, Father Busa on the screen now. Beginning in the late 1940s, Busa began to use computers to study the meaning of words used by Aquinas, such as how the meaning or interpretation of the same word might vary depending on the other words with which it appeared, so words in context. Busa, working with IBM, created a concordance of all 11 million words in the Aquinas corpus and located the words in context. This project stretched computational processes of the time and stretched technology, and it made an argument about how and where Busa understood the meanings of Aquinas' words to reside and how he might best study them. Following Aquinas, much early work in digital humanities, and again, the term was not then in use, focused on the creation of concordances. Scholars then turned to author attribution studies, and through the mid-1980s, concordances and similar projects were the main thrust of humanities computing, as it was then called. In this stage, the work of early digital humanists was hampered by technology. Before the era of personal computers, humanists rarely had access to the computational power that they needed. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, as computers found their way into work and home offices, humanists could suddenly do more. Importantly, they could communicate more. In addition to the mainstays of creating concordances and performing attribution studies, digital humanities was affected by the emergence of hypertext. The centrality of hypertext to DH increased with the coming of the World Wide Web. The Text Encoding Initiative, whose website you'll see on the screen now, was established in the late 1980s, and TEI gave rise to, among other areas of study, the electronic scholarly edition, of which the Whitman Archive is an example. In this period as well, collaboration emerged as a central component of digital scholarship and digital humanities. These collaborations were often interinstitutional and interdisciplinary in nature, involving two or more scholars to whole teams of scholars from single institutions or institutions throughout the United States and throughout the world. Today then, digital humanities projects include electronic scholarly editions, text and data mining, author attribution studies, historical geographic information systems, and geospatial analyses of literary texts, and the creation of tools and platforms for the presentation and interpretation of humanistic artifacts, to name just a few. Other projects are interested in the way the digital alters our experience of the world for better and worse, and they study the digital from both real world and theoretical perspectives. Recognizing the growth and importance of digital humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities established the Office of Digital Humanities in 2008, and that's uh, the website that's on your screens now. Following a several years long initiative to cultivate DH, the Office of Digital Humanities was created. Institutions are hiring in digital humanities at a brisk pace in both academic departments and in libraries, and um, this pace is brisk, I suppose, relative to the larger job market. And many imagine a not too distant future when the humanities are the digital humanities, and libraries are playing a crucial role in that work, whether as formal partners or as consultants on an ad hoc basis. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Karen, who will talk about how this digital humanities work actually gets done. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Karen Dalzell. I work in the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities as a digital resources designer. Um, so I do some programming and some web design and a lot of putting websites together and fixing broken websites. Um, I'm going to begin my part of the talk with uh, I'm going to talk about where to start with doing DH. Uh, up first is conferences, because this is often where you make the connections that lead to digital humanities projects. They're all about uh, collaboration with a lot of different people, usually. Um, so I'll talk about ALA annual 
first, I didn't go to this year's ALA annual, but I looked at the uh, schedule and I was really sad I didn't go. I counted nine sessions that actually mentioned digital humanity specifically, and there may have been more sessions that used a slightly different term. Um, and I think there was a pre-conference too. So digital humanities is increasingly becoming a buzzword in the library community, and it's getting easier to find other librarians interested in talking about digital humanities. And actually, just last night I saw um, in the library with the lead pipe, I think that blog is called, has a nice article on digital humanities that's a pretty good resource too. Um, so, of course, the conversation shouldn't end with librarians, so that's what leads me to that camps. Thanks for advancing this for me. Um, so, uh, that camps are informational, uh, uh, they're informal unconferences, where a bunch of like-minded people get together and they talk about whatever they want, really. Uh, that camp stands for the Humanities and Technology Camp. So it incorporates topics as wide-ranging as how to make your own wearable technology to digital humanities, libraries, and public engagement. And that last session was one I actually attended at that camp, Iowa City, which was held a few months ago. Uh, that camps are springing up all over, and as one example, an up upcoming that camp, and this is the screen that's up right now, is that camp, libraries, and digital humanities, and that'll be this November in Denver. So I'm hoping to go to that one. I think it'll be pretty exciting. Um, so other conferences, uh, the American Historical Association, the Modern Languages Association, the American His uh, and the American Literature Association, they've all included digital humanities sessions at their last conferences. Um, some of them have very big digital humanities programs. And as the digital humanities gather more popularity, you will likely seeing, see more of these types of things and kind of the subject conferences for different academic subjects. Um, and also online, even if you can't go to any conferences, uh, digital humanists are by and large very active on the internet and on Twitter specifically. There's a Twitter list that I have up here that's digital humanities that's maintained by Dan Cohen. And I'll talk about a few other places to find digital humanists online. And so if you find them, um, you just start to talk to them and you join in the conversation and you find people that have like-minded like interests. Um, the point of joining conversations at conferences and online isn't just to learn about digital humanities and how it works and what kinds of projects exist and who is doing it, although those things are nice, but to connect with people interested in collaborating on projects. If you go into these spaces prepared to talk about what you are interested in, uh, whether it's local history or preservation of board games, and you find people to get excited with. So next I'm going to talk about um, digital humanities models, a few different ways in which digital humanities gets done. So first I'm going to talk about individuals. Uh, individuals do a lot of digital humanities work. Um, a lot of projects actually started as individual projects and then they move on to center or bigger projects or multi-institutional projects um, because somebody has an interest in something and they scratch that itch. They, uh, they are often working at a university, but not always. Um, and sometimes they have no formal anything training, they don't have programming experience or anything, and they create their own projects and they teach themselves the necessary skills. And this is where libraries come into play because libraries can help support these individual scholars. Um, sometimes these individuals might get small starter grants to help their research either through an institution, sometimes cities, um, sometimes states, uh, especially if, if it's got a local history uh, slant, you can sometimes get this kind of local support. Um, but sometimes they just put in their own time and they, you know, buy their own web space and they just do their own project, um, again, because it's what they're interested in. So it can also include people outside academia and there are uh, people librarians, um, these are the people librarians at universities without a formal support system might be called on to assist and even in public libraries. So just a few examples here. Uh, Jean Bauer, this is her project Davila, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it's an open source relational database schema visualization and annotation tool. Jean has a PhD in history. She started the project while she was a ninth graduate fellow and she did the programming and design on the project and she is now a digital humanities librarian at Brown University. Yeah. Um, and there might be individuals outside the university system who do D DH projects to scratch a personal itch. So this is uh, Ben Brumfield. He's a computer programmer who has started this project to aid in transcription and annotation of his family diaries. And he's built a platform so other people are now using the same platform. And when Ben started this project, he was not in the digital humanities, but he worked on his own and developed a network of people to consult with. And so it's really interesting to watch people um, from within academia and public history and all these people kind of get together and talk about how best to do these projects. 
So you might even include people who are doing work that they probably wouldn't define in DH. Maybe some people in DH might not even define it as such. But I think it fits many of the properties that we were talking about. These are a new kind of public humanities gone digital. As barriers to much digital work are constantly lowered, we will see more and more of this type of work. Public librarians may be called on to help a community member start a site, and librarians can help raise awareness of how to grow and link these sites. So just as, as one small example, and there's a whole bunch of these out there, but I like this one because it's based in Nebraska. Um, Alma of Alma's Diary lived in Guide Rock, Nebraska. And this is her granddaughter. I don't actually know her name. She remains anonymous. But her granddaughter is publishing short entries from her grandmother's diary. She adds commentary. She adds some tagging systems. And she does it on several different social networking sites. And so this, this I think, is on the very low end of what DH is. But because she is doing that tagging and she's kind of organizing it, I think it kind of fits in that, that definition. And I think more and more people are going to kind of start doing this. And as they do, we'll be able to pull out of it a kind of a vast local history. Like people are doing it and they don't even know that's what they're doing. Right. Yeah. As a yeah. name. Yeah. What they're doing. And, and yeah. I think especially in public libraries, if people come in to, to get help with this kind of thing, if we can kind of fit it in that framework, then we can go, oh, we have resources that can help with this kind of thing. Because if you think about it as digital humanities, you can say, let's ask a digital humanist how they would handle this. Um, okay. So I, I one other section I wanted to talk about was digital humanities in the classroom. Uh, there are many digital humanists have brought their digital research in methods into the classroom. And I'm going to go over three examples of this, but there are more and more every day. So first I'm going to talk about Brian Croxell's undergraduate survey assignment, The American Century. Feature, it featured an interactive timeline and an interactive map of American literature following the Civil War. Uh, the students created an assignment in HTML and they use spreadsheets. This is actually all pulled from an online Google Doc. And it allows them to see their work in a more visual way than another paper and uh, than just writing another paper. And it gives them experience in writing HTML and working with databases and these are skills that they'll probably need once they get outside of the classroom. Um, Casey Nash's project on our <laughs> I gotta read this. On Our Way for the Sunny South Land of Chivalry was created for a summer research seminar in digital history at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, and she, this will be incorporated into her master's thesis. This project features many visualizations. She has an interactive map and timeline like Brian Croxo's student project. And she has a concept map shown here where you can kind of see how different concepts mapped out through time. PRISM is a graduate practicum project of the Praxis program out of the Scholars Lab, which I'll talk about a little bit later, too. Um, the, the Scholars Lab is a digital humanities center at the University of Nebraska, Virginia. And six graduate students created a software project to collaboratively analyze text. And in the process, they learned about every aspect of creating a digital humanities software project, including writing all the coding, doing the HTML, and the design, and the promotion. So it's probably worth mentioning that all of these student projects that I picked, I just handpicked a few, um, involve the creation of visualizations. And that's one way digital humanities is looking at data in a new way. And I think especially for students, um, they do so much paper writing. It's really nice to kind of get in there and do other things with uh, literary text or historical archives and, and visualize them in a different way. Um, on a larger scale, digital humanities centers, uh, they're usually hosted at universities. I think there might be a few outside of universities, maybe, but they're, they're generally located inside a university. Um, they're a formalized way to support projects. These centers are usually staffed with programmers, designers, metadata experts, mapping experts, librarians, and anyone else who can help support an ongoing list of projects. Below are three examples of digital humanities centers to give an idea of the diversity of activities. At the end, I will give a way to find more centers. So CDRH, this is where I work and, and where Elizabeth works. Uh, we, uh, I'm a designer, and she's a project manager. And what's your new title? Well, <laughs> I have several titles. She, she, does, <laughs> she does everything. I, I love working with Liz because she keeps everything together. Um, so we have, we have a metadata encoding specialist, which is great because she gets every, all of the XML in a great format. Um, we have uh, programmers, we have me, I'm a designer, several librarians that really help get everything. And the librarians are great because they know where to get all the stuff that we need for all the projects. Um, and we have other faculty from uh, modern languages, from, from history, from English. And 
everybody works together to create these projects. Um, we support projects that originate within the university as well as massive projects that utilize talent from across several universities like the Whitman Archive. The CDRH is physically located in a library, so it's at UNL's Love Library. And it's a joint initiative with the College of Arts and Sciences along with the library. We work primarily with text, digitizing, displaying, analyzing, and coding, usually with TEI, and visualizing them. Other activities include mapping, language preservation, and metadata research. Notable projects include the Walt Whitman Archive, the Cather Archive, the Journals of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Civil War Washington, and uh, the William F. Cody Archive is a, a newer one of ours. CDRH also has a hand in pedagogy, playing a major role in the creation of a graduate certificate in the digital humanities, and serving as a place for graduate and undergraduate students to learn the ins and outs of digital humanities. So a little bit different, uh, the Center for History and New Media is located in Fairfax, Virginia at George Mason University, and it has a slightly different focus. This is a digital history center rather than a digital humanities center, and while they have projects that digitize and analyze text and images, such as Gulag, Many Days, Many Lives, their main focus is on tools. The CH&M's most popular tools are Omeka, a platform for publishing collections and exhibitions, and Zotero, a citation management system. I think it would be hard to be in the library world without hearing of at least one of these projects. Um, and so they use Omeka as a platform for building many of their other projects, such as the se September 11th Digital Archive, and administratively, CH&M is not affiliated with the library and depends heavily on grants for continued funding. So one final example, and again, I'm just cherry picking three examples of a whole bunch. Uh, the Scholars Lab is located in the University of Virginia libraries, and it has a deep focus in pedagogy, especially at the graduate level. The recently launched Praxis program, which I talked about before, is a pilot effort to realign graduate methodological training with the demands of the humanities in the digital age. They do this by choosing several grad students and working with them to build a digital humanities pro project, with, which was PRISM in this, in this first uh, year that they went through. The initiative comes after years of formally hosting, mentoring, and assisting graduate students with their own projects. In addition, the Scholars Lab is heavily involved in mapping projects. The Scholars Lab, like the CDRH, is physically located in a library and involves many librarians. And it has also been instrumental in developing Blacklight, a free and open source Ruby on Rails based discovery interface, also known as a next generation catalog. On a smaller scale than centers, a small group or lab might have just a few individuals, and this may encompass any group that is formed to research digital humanities like operations, but maybe doesn't have the formal support that a center does. So it could be temporary, it could just be an experiment to see how it goes. Um, sometimes labs are later folded into existing departments, but they're meant to experiment with new possibilities. And just one example of this, the New York Public Library Labs, they had a group called the Digital Experience Group that implemented several projects during 2007 to 2009, and this became New York Public Library Labs. The group partners with outside organizations such as Flickr and creates projects that are outside what the New York Public Library had provided, such as the New York Public Library Map Rectifier Project. And next I'm going to talk about massive collaborations. So a lot of what we do in the center is work on projects that are actually with us and another center or with other scholars at another university. The Whitman Archive is a good example of this. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk, talk about is digging into data. This was an office for digital humanities at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, they, they decided that they wanted to provide a grant, grant for this. And it's a grant to help figure out what to do with all the data that librarians, scholars, and digital humanists have created. And this grant must be applied for as an international collaboration. So it has to be between countries. And so you get this massive um, network of people working on these things. Uh, the next one is the Whitman Archive. And since Liz knows a bit more about this than me, I'm going to let her talk about how the collaboration works. Yeah, I've already said a bit about the Whitman Archive, but on the collaborative end, um, it's, I think, useful to know just how big of a project the Whitman Archive is. It's co-directed by Kenneth M. Price um, and Ed Folsom. Ken Price is at the University of Nebraska. Ed Folsom is at the University of Iowa. The project originated in 1995 and was interinstitutional at the very beginning. Currently, um, we have five different I guess six different universities actively contributing to the Whitman Archive with faculty and undergraduate and graduate students all contributing to the to the project. Um, I think between the different institutions there are more than 20 graduate students currently contributing to the project 
and it's a, become a training ground in some ways for the next generation of literary scholars, but also digital humanists, with many of the students who've worked on the Whitman Archive going on to digital humanities programs, to teach in digital humanities programs, and then to develop their own projects. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few resources that you can look at, uh, places to find um, other people or the kind of support that you might want or just to learn more about the digital humanities. So first I want to talk about CenterNet. CenterNet is an international network of digital humanities centers and is part of the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. And um, you can see on the map there on the screen that the digital humanities centers are all over the world. So this is a good way to, to kind of find a center near you and see what they might be up to and see if maybe some collaboration is possible. Uh, next, I'll talk about the Office of Digital Humanities. That's, again, part of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And they offer many grants for specifically for digital humanities. They have a very active blog. Um, they post, uh, whenever new grants are awarded, they post them so you can kind of see what kind of grants people are getting and what kind of projects pe people are getting funded. Um, and then they also have um, digital humanities startup grants, which are smaller grants. I think they're thirty to 60000 in yeah. that range. And so these are grants to kind of get a proof of concept up, to maybe work on a smaller project that, that doesn't need quite the, the big grants that are also out there. Um, Digital Humanities Questions and Answers. This is a great site. Uh, it's, it's modeled after a lot of the tech sites where you can ask programming questions. But I think it's a really nice place for people who are just starting to learn programming, just starting to put together their own projects. Um, I find it a lot friendlier than some of the online tech um, a lot of the online tech ones, people will be a little short with you and say, you should go j just read this. And um, I, I find that on this site, people are a lot more, they'll walk you through things a little bit more. And you can ask a question about just about anything. Uh, the Humanist mailing list, this has been around since 1987. It looks like the earliest date on there is. Um, you can sign up for the Humanist mailing list if you want. You can also just read all the archives on this site. And uh, it's... It's very active. Um, I would say it's one of the more active places. I think this and Twitter are probably your best bets for actually um, conversing with people. And uh, it's a really good way to get um, a lot of job announcements are made on this list and a lot of new projects are announced. So it's a good way to kind of get a feel about what's going on in the digital humanities. Uh, I mentioned earlier the digital humanities Twitter list. Um, and DH Now is, uh, this is a collaboratively edited digital humanities resource, kind of like a half magazine, half RSS feed. And they, it kind of has two components. There's a fire hose kind of that, that just brings in everything. And then they also have an, an edited, so you can see it says editor's choice up there. So if you want, you can either get just the stuff that's kind of handpicked or you can look at everything that's being announced. And the editors, they take into consideration not only um, the, the kind of intrinsic value, but also how much people are talking about something. So uh, we're going to give com concluding remarks now, and I'll let Liz go first. Do you have any concluding remarks? I can give mine if you want. You can go first. Okay. Um, what excites me about digital humanities is I think that it's it's – I think academic libraries have seen a lot of it up till now, but I think it's going to become more prevalent in public libraries as public historians create more sites. It's already started. I've seen a lot of it. Um, Alma's Diary is one example, but I've seen a lot of these kinds of people going through their own archives and trying to make sense of them and get them online. Uh, public libraries can help by giving workshops on how best to create and showcase this work and what the best tools are, and they can get help through any of these digital humanities resources. And I like digital humanities because of this shift. The public has never had greater access to and chances for comprehension when these resources than now when these resources are online and everybody can get to them. Um, also, being online, these resources can grow and change over time and should always reflect the best and most accurate information we have. Finally, digital humanities allows us to explore topics in ways we have never been able to before through text analysis, visualizations on-the-fly mapping of data, and I'm really excited to see what the future of digital humanities holds. I'll just, I guess, a few uh, comments. And say first that in academic libraries, digital humanities is not just something for research one institutions. Many smaller state universities and private colleges are hiring in digital humanities, 
and libraries may likely be called upon to help these scholars with their projects, to buy books and journal subscriptions in the field, and to collaborate on project creation. And also as a humanities scholar, my background is in English, but I'm also pursuing a master's degree in library science. I'm excited about what digital humanities means for my research and my colleagues' research and how we actually do our work. I'm also taken by the possibilities that digital humanities creates for conveying this information to the scholarly community and to the public in ways that we've not been able to do in the past. In my view, digital humanities creates more open, less insular, and more relevant academic institutions. Thank you, um, Karen and Liz. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments or um, anything you want to share? Uh, type them into the question section. We didn't get anything while you were talking. Um, so feel free to type in your questions, your comments, anything you have to share. Um, I also want to let everyone know that during the session, and I think I caught them all, um, all of the websites and everything that Karen and Liz mentioned have been saved into the Library Commission's Delicious account as we normally do when we do these sessions. So when the recording is available and up, you will be able to have a link to all of them collected in one place. Um, and I think I was able to find every single one of them and catch them as you okay. guys were. I, can, I can send you an email <laughs> with all of them too. So um, because there's a lot of things going through very quickly, lots mm -hmm. of examples. And as you said, these aren't the only ones out there either. This is just yeah. like a start or yeah. sampling of yeah. places to go, ways to get started, figuring it out. Mm -hmm. um, in that also that um, Michael, actually, Michael Sowers, our technology innovation librarian here, who's behind the camera at the moment, um, hiding, had shared that um, blog post from um, in the library with the lead pipe, okay. actually. With, yeah. So um, they mentioned that. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's on the list as well. So I'm not even sure how many. I was just cranking through them all. So anybody have any questions, comments, anything you want to share or ask of Karen and Liz while they're here, trapped? <laughs> yeah, and our, our emails are up there too. So if yes. you do have questions later on um, or want to talk about anything, feel free to email us. Nobody has no. any questions. Does we we look like anything. <laughs> Oh wait, we have one thing. Uh, Jan Sears, who's from Kimball Public Library. Um, we have a genealogy group active in the library with tons of obituaries and files and cataloged on note cards. How to transfer that to this project is a big question. Mm -hmm. I think it's it can be hard for public libraries. That the first start, the the first step, of course, is transcribing, and that mm. can take a really long time. Um, and I think getting it into that text format is definitely the first step. And the nice thing about things like that is you can usually get a lot of community support. So you can usually say community volunteers yeah, or students or somebody yeah. that, yeah. And you could just set up a blog and just like each entry could be a, spe a, a separate um, obituary and then you can tag them. And the nice thing about it is later you can pull, if you wanted to do something a bit more complex like text analysis later on, you can pull that out of the database and then um, so if you you're going you're getting that first step done but that doesn't mean that you can't do more with it later on mm -hmm. um, we've had uh, we have a project at the um, what is it called in Beatrice the homesteading national monument oh, homestead national monument. Yeah. yeah and mm -hmm. a bunch of volunteers out there uh, helped transcribe a lot of these original homesteading documents oh, right. for us and so we we find that it's it's pretty easy to get volunteers for these types of mm -hmm. things um, People like doing it. So if you have yeah. a few computers you can set up and people can come in and, you know, just, just type out what's on there. And, and genealogy is a huge topic. Like she says, it's mm -hmm. a very a group that's active in the library. And yep. that's a huge, you just, you know, tap them and say, here's the new project. You guys want to do something that yeah. will help get this information out and record it, really. Mm -hmm. Not just these note cards, as she says. I mean, that's fine. but. Yeah those note cards eventually are going to fall apart, get yeah. lost. And making them <laughs> searchable and getting it, I mean, yes, that, you get it yes. out in, in I, I say a blog format, it doesn't have to be a blog, but that's just, it's a nice, easy administrative way mm -hmm. to do it. Um, and the nice thing about that is then it'll be searchable by the whole web, you know, right. so if anybody's searching mm -hmm. for a certain person, they'll hit on it just by searching in Google. Right. The whole goal of all this is making it available to what? To making it available <laughs> to um, everyone who's mm -hmm. out there, not just people that could walk into your library and yeah. look at your note cards. Yeah. Did you have a and question? Well, and we Michael have, has something. We, to say. we offer blogging services here for public libraries and the commission on WordPress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might might be a way to mm -hmm. go. 
Um, I have a question though about that particular example or, or using that example for my question would be how important would it be to get volunteers to transcribe it but then get volunteers to verify the transcriptions? Mm -hmm. kind of I like think a both two step things, process. Yeah, 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 both things are important. Um, I think getting it transcribed the first time is, is important uh, and then you know you can have that two-step process just say okay we you know now you're gonna come in and sometimes people I think who are not very good at typing out the entries are actually very yeah. good at doing the proofreading ah. so you might ask people what they're more interested in because there are some people that are really slow typists but they're, <laughs> uh -huh. they're good at catching those differences mm -hmm. so it depends on the handwriting of the source material right? exactly <laughs> and, and I think I'm actually gonna move this toward Liz because I think Liz can speak towards um, <laughs> Whitman had like kind of yeah. notoriously bad. Well, yeah, I mean we've seen the examples from Whitman, or the manuscript example from Whitman, and his hand. I thought it was probably a cleaner manuscript. So yeah, there was um, one screenshot there that was just illegible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other materials that we're working on now for Civil War Washington, um, the set that we're working on now, are, um, seem to be. We're not entirely sure what they are, but they seem to be kind of court records related to. Um, slaves in the district who filed for their emancipation following the passage of a DC Emancipation Act in 1862 and those were written on the fly by someone with horrible handwriting who was trying to capture oral testimony and those are in, wow. and we're working from digitized microfilm that wasn't great quality to begin with mm -hmm. so it's kind of every everything that could be go wrong has gone wrong with that um, and we've decided that you know, Civil War Washington is in part an editorial project and so for us we do the initial transcription and encoding and then every record is getting two if not three rounds of checking ultimately signed off by a director of the project um, but that's because how of how we've defined the project and um, its editorial goals and so for other projects I think that the degree of checking and um, you know how many people are going to look at it and what is good enough to go live. I mean, we have we hope that our transcriptions are 100% accurate. They never are. That's our goal. But you know, depending on what the the needs of the library are, you will probably be better off with a, a much leaner kind of editorial pipeline. Yeah, and and parts of it like you probably want the names really checked over right. and and. You know, that's probably more important for purposes of searching, whereas if the is spelled wrong somewhere, that's not as big a deal. And where, where would OCR software fall into that? Actually, versus... that's the question that Jan no. just actually, <laughs> related to that, just um, typed in. They only have three to five active members, unfortunately, in the challenge mm -hmm. groups. It's not as huge, but... A blog is a good idea, she says, and then she asks, can the obits be scanned and tagged? So doing it that they way. They can. Yeah. You can get OCR software, and there's actually some free solutions online now that you can kind of play with. They kind of change. It seems like they come and go, and so you have to do a search for, like, free OCR software. Um, your results may vary. The OCR software that we use, is it's fairly expensive. I think it's, like, 600 to to $1,000, I think, for the program for a seat. Mm -hmm. And so... It is very useful, but at the same time, it's pretty expensive. And the, the results, um, it only works if it's typewritten pretty clearly. It doesn't right. work for handwriting at all, of course. But So if there's a lot of this material, it can be, it might be useful, and maybe you could find someone in the community that would be willing to pay for it or find a group of people say, hey, we want to raise money to buy this software. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the cards were typed originally right. instead of handwritten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, then that might work. So. And, and in your experience, has the, like free or open source OCR worth the time? Well, I found some of them that work pretty well, but there's generally a limit to the amount you can run through it. So, like, you're limited to like 20 documents or whatever. At least the ones that I've tried, and so. Um, and like, you know, Evernote does free OCR, but it doesn't actually give you the text back in a useful format. So, um, so a lot of these are kind of iffy, and the software is still expensive enough that. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to use. Yeah. Oh, and she wants to know if that software is on the ADA computers. Oh, I believe she's talking about the computers that we just uh, gave to the libraries. No, it's not the same kind of thing that's on there. No, that's just reading. That's just text software to read it out loud to um, mm -hmm. people with vision problems. Things. It's not the same kind of software. No, you wouldn't be able to use that software for this um, purpose. It doesn't do the same thing. Any other 
which is thanks for the ideas. <laughs> You might have some calls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to email, I mean, we, we can tell you what software we use. Um, we switched when we went to Mac instead of PC, so we have different because one of them isn't made for Mac, and yeah. um, so um, we we have some that we've used, and you know they work pretty well. But transcribing sometimes is almost as fast, depending on how good the software is going to do with the with the text. Right. Hey, any other questions, comments? For Karen and Liz, anything you have to say behind the scenes, cameraman? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look like anybody is desperately ty nobody typed anything in between what Jan was saying, so that's fine. Um, so I, I guess I'll say if nobody has anything urgent that they need to know right now, um, you have their contact information. Of course, feel free to call, um, email them with any questions you might have. Mm -hmm. Um, session has been recorded, so it will be available um, to you, and we'll let you guys know when it's up there and ready. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation will be al along with it, so you'll have that to refer to. And as I said, all the links that were mentioned during the session will be um, there as well, so you have access to all of that. Um, so nothing has come in yet right now. Um, thank you very much, Karen and Liz. That was very thank interesting. You. I personally didn't know anything about digital mm -hmm. humanity. I mean, you know, for it, of course, <laughs> and because you do it all the time. I hear about it. Um, but no, I didn't know much about it myself either, but it's it sounds very, very interesting. It's a mixture of a lot of different fields. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, you can come at it as far as getting involved in it from various directions, technical, mm -hmm. graphic design, just being interested, like you know, saying, we're into genealogy. Yeah. And you don't know it, but that's what you're doing. Yeah. It's digital humanities. Yeah. And um, you just now have a name to attach to mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and I think sometimes that's a big help because then you know what to search for to get help. Right, you to know? get more information and help yeah. about how can we do this better, what yeah. process could we use, what software, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so a lot of these resources would be great for people. Okay, well thank you very much um, you guys and thank you everyone for attending this morning. Um, we will be back on a regular Wednesday next week uh, as usual, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, so I hope you'll join us for next week's session which is a day in the life of the scholarship student conference attendee. Um, here at the Library Commission, we have an IMLS grant, 21st Century Librarian grant, and we gave state stipends to scholarship students um, to attend um, conferences. And um, I'm not sure which conferences they've all attended, but we're going to have a group of scholarship students, about five or six people here, who are going to talk about what conferences they attended, how they what they did there, you know, their first experiences attending these national conferences, things like ALA that was just happened that you were mm -hmm. just mentioning, um, and other conferences. So um, we'll have a group of students sharing their experiences with us. So if you're interested in what happened at conference or how you can possibly get involved yourself, um, that will be a good one to attend. So um, thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next week back on our Wednesdays. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>